Hi everybody, welcome to another iGDAT WF repair video. This is the second part of this Kenwood TS180S amateur radio transceiver repair. In the first part I have shown how this continuous tone was fixed by addressing some issues on the power regulator's PCB. A link to the first part video is in the description below. At this point, the other evident fault of this radio is that some frequency bands look completely dead, like the 14 MHz one, the 21 MHz, and some of the 28 and 29 MHz ones. The approach I use on this kind of repairs is to follow the adjustment procedures and look for problems whenever an adjustment step cannot be completed correctly. New problems started to appear as soon as I reached the VCO voltage adjustment step. Basically, what we need to do is adjust some variable inductors named T1 to T4 until we see the correct voltage on a test point. Then check on another test point that we get an oscillating waveform at the correct frequency according to this table. The 14 MHz band coil could be adjusted to obtain the correct voltage. However, on 14.0 MHz the oscillator frequency is 21.83 MHz. But according to the manual it should be 22.83 MHz, not 21. On the 21 MHz band, the coil did not even have any working setting at all. Now, to debug this part of the transceiver, we have to understand how the PLL, which is the acronym for Phase Locked Loop, works in a multiband radio. At the very least, in this case, we have to identify what parts of the PLL circuit depend on the band being selected and what instead are the common circuits that are likely working fine. The first obvious aspect would be the voltage controlled oscillators. Notice that there are four of them to cover all the bands, so for example the VCO number 2 is in common to the 14 MHz and the 21 MHz bands, but it's not likely the problem, since it could be made to work on the 14 MHz band, albeit at exactly 1 MHz difference from the correct range. The next blocks that depends on the selected band are the BPF or bandpass filters. In this case, the filter used on 21 MHz band is different than the one used on the 14 MHz one, so this might be a good circuit to check. The last band dependent circuits are the programmable dividers. As it was a common practice in those years, they are implemented with 74 LS logic chips, so this is usually the easiest thing to be checked before firing up the big instruments needed to troubleshoot the other analog circuits. However, before checking anything else, it's a good idea to check the diode selection matrix that selects the right VCO, PPF and divider setting based on the band selector switch position. The diode matrix is just a bunch of small signal diodes that takes a positive voltage coming from the band switch active line and brings that voltage to one or more outputs. In this transceiver the matrix is in part made of diodes scattered on the main PLL PCB and in part made with a small daughter board called the matrix unit. It is the small daughter board sitting upside down in this picture. I've checked all the diodes in it and refreshed all the solder joints. I've also checked all the diodes that are scattered on the rest of the PLL PCB, but I've not found any bad one, and nothing changed on the radio behavior. However, this step is usually a good idea before diving into further troubleshooting.
The programmable divider is made with two chained 4-bit TTL counters that have a preset input. They are Q22 and Q19. When they come down to zero, they are automatically initialized with a fixed 8-bit value that depends on the selected frequency band. The preset 8-bit value is generated by 8 transistor switches that are seen on the left part of this image. They drive pins 3 to 6 of the two TTL counters. The transistors are driven by the outputs of the diode matrix. Of course, on the service manual, there is a table with the correct 8 bits divider values for each frequency band. So here we have the two counters Q19 and Q22. All I'm going to do is check the voltage on pin 3 to 6 on each band with the multimeter. After a few minutes' work, I obtained this table. Of course, when I've measured a voltage close to 5 volts, I have indicated it with its logic equivalent of 1. A voltage close to 0 volts instead corresponds to the logic 0. I cannot really tell that there is an issue here, since the preset word for 14 MHz and 21 MHz bands is the same, and these cannot be correct. Then I compared the measured values with the table on the manual. All the preset words are correct except for both the 14 MHz and 21 MHz ones. The 14 MHz value has one wrong bit that is a 0 instead of a 1. And the 21 MHz word has two wrong bits that are set to 0 instead of 1. But I can exclude a problem with the transistor switches since the same bits are set correctly to one and some other bands. If we go back on the schematic, the wrong bits are caused by Q39 of 14 MHz that is turned on and it should not, and Q41 plus Q44 on 21 MHz that are both turned on but should be off. So this is really puzzling, as it seems the two faults have nothing in common, but surely the wrong transistors are turned on for some fault in the diode matrix, so let's try to investigate. I will initially focus on Q39 for the 14 MHz band. As we can see from the schematic, it can be turned on by a positive voltage on pin 9 from the matrix unit, but also from D014 and D013 that are on the PLL PCB. And yes, there is a positive voltage on pin 9 indeed. Now, I've already checked all diodes in this matrix PCB, so I suspect one of the inputs is driven erroneously by some other leaky component in the main PCB, so a voltage output on pin 9 could only come through these four diodes circled in red in the picture, corresponding to one of the four inputs also circled in red on the left. So, let's check the inputs. No voltage on pins 2 and 3, but we have voltage on pin 7. Hmm, the voltage is still present even without the matrix PCB. And it's not coming from the band switch assembly. The wrong voltage also disappears when the band switch is unplugged from the board. The test I have just made suggests that there is a voltage leaking from the 14 MHz band switch line to the 21 MHz line happening on the PLL PCB. Looking at the schematic, the only components that could be leaking are D8 and D38. The capacitor array CA1 right under the band switch connector could, in theory, be leaking internally, but there is a very unlikely fault. So I have lifted D8 and D38. In this way I can check which one is leaking. So let's see... No voltage on D38. And no voltage on D8 also. Mm. Oh, 
and there is still the leaking voltage on the 21 MHz line. This is so weird. As I have shown before, the only other component left that could be leaking was the CA1 capacitor array, so I haven't soldered it now. So far so good, no more room voltage at the input of the diode matrix now. At this point, things got really weird. In the previous measurements, obviously, the CA1 array was removed. By the way, it looks identical to the one right over it in this image. However, I couldn't measure any possible leakage between the internal capacitors of the removed array, even using a 13 volt source, which is more than the 8 volt that are applied on the array during normal operations. So I've decided to solder it back and try again. Well, no erroneous voltage anymore. Now let me explain what likely happened. When I removed CA1, I've also cleaned the PCB around the polded part with isopropyl alcohol, as I always do during repairs. I sprayed both sides of the PCB with the alcohol. On the component side, I noticed some oily residues near the matrix PCB connector, but I didn't pay much attention to it or take any picture anyway. However, the substance likely had enough low resistance to allow some voltage to build between adhesion spins under the conductor, as 14 MHz and 21 MHz band pins are next to each other. This substance was probably used by someone else to restore any missing contact on the matrix PCB connection, hoping that that would cure problems on this board. So I decided to unsolder and clean both the matrix PCB connectors and in this picture I already removed one of them. And this picture shows the final result. I've also carefully cleaned all the solder flux residues from this PCB that were probably left untouched since the original manufacturing of this transceiver. Now I can try to complete the alignment step from where I stopped before. PCO voltage for the 14 MHz and 21 MHz bands is now OK. The VCO frequency for 14 MHz is now correct. The 21 MHz band now seems to work. And also, the VCO frequency for 21 MHz is correct. Unfortunately, the four bands that cover the 28 and 29 MHz have still issues. Sometimes one band works and then stops working as soon as the VFO knob is turned, or starts working again after the transceiver warms up. Some other times a band stops working as soon as the transceiver is switched in transmit mode. Since now both the VCO circuits and the programmable dividers are working correctly, the only remaining issue on the PLL circuit should only be in the bandpass filters. So I decided to try the alignment procedures for them. Basically, the bandpass filters are a series of tuned LC circuits that allow only signals having a certain range of frequencies to pass through. However, the procedure asks for a sweep generator which isn't an instrument I keep on my lab anymore. The manual also gives a schematic of a simple RF detector to be used with the oscilloscope. I clearly need to come up with a different method to obtain the same results. To inject the test signal, I'll use an RF generator, the HP8640B. This one has no frequency sweep capabilities. So I will manually sweep the tuning on the required interval between 13.5 MHz and 10 MHz, back and forth. And to display the filter shape I use a spectrum analyzer. 
This one has a CRT with high phosphor persistence, so I can observe the peak signal shape on a short interval like this. At the moment there is just one cable, so the peak is flat. I'm going to use an active probe to avoid loading the circuit under test. And here is the complete setup. The oscilloscope probe is just used to inject the signal from the generator on the right test point. The three coils to be tuned are the ones circled with the blue color in this image. I won't show the actual tuning process, as anyway, I bumped the camera tripod a few times when turning back and forth to look at the different instruments. Anyway, I had to increase the injected signal to stay enough higher than the other frequency picked by the probe from other sequences of the radio. Then I moved each coil slightly and checked the shape against the, the one shown on the manual, doing a couple of manual sweeps, then moved the second coil slightly and checked again, then the third coil and back to the first again. At the beginning, however, the filter shape was really off, so I think that this was indeed the problem with the 28 and 29 MHz bands. Now all the bands look fine. To complete the alignment procedures, I had to access some of the internal PCBs. Some of them are stacked one on top of the other. But it's possible to work on all of them without disconnecting anything. When I was putting all back together, I found this resistor disconnected. One side of it clearly goes to a ground screw, but now I need to look on the schematic for the right place to solder the other side. It is a 1 kilo ohm resistor. After some time searching, I found this 1 kilo ohm resistor connected to one contact of the mod selector switch S2 and ground. So I have soldered it back and finished assembling the last modules. The sensitivity of these old transceivers is usually very good. Minus 130 dBm is the lowest signal amplitude that this generator can produce. Thank you.